Hello, welcome. I think it's time to start. We're a couple minutes past. Whatever, we'll catch up. Uh, we'll go fast. Hi, I'm Ava. Uh, I do stuff at Microsoft. I've been doing open source for a minute or two. This is Ed. And I'm Ed. I get into random trouble uh, throughout the industry. We're going to kind of skip intros. Most of you might know who we are. We're pretty easy to find online. Uh, so we're assuming you know a little bit about our background, but you're really here to learn about this project, which uh, you may have heard of Gitbomb. We've rebranded, the community all agreed, and had a lovely voting discussion, chose this name and logo, Omnibor, which stands for Universal Bill of Receipts. So quick backstory on this. Uh, I have tried for all of my 20 odd years in tech to say I don't do security. Uh, and then a couple years ago, well, supply chain security became a hot topic. I'm like, okay, fine, fine. I'll, uh, I'll go look at the tools that people are using for this supply chain security business and kind of approach it with a bit of a beginner's mind. I've never really thought about an SBOM or, you know, source composition analysis tools. And I went, look at the field of what's out there. I'm like, wow, this is a tangled mess. We can't even agree on what the term attestation means or what format to sign packages with or what format to describe the dependency an SBOM in. Gosh, this is a tangled mess. Wouldn't it be nice if it was simpler? It's really frustrating. At the bottom of, of security, we all want to know, am I safe? Am I safe to download this piece of software from somewhere on the internet and run it in my home or in my company? When I'm buying a piece of software from a supplier or a piece of hardware, a server to stick in a rack in my data center, am I safe? Is the software in that machine that's baked in the firmware, baked into the baseband management controller, does it contain log for shell? I want to know that, and it's kind of hard to get that answer. So I feel kind of unsafe because I don't know how to know what's in the box. But hey, SBOMs are kind of a thing, and we're all talking about them now, thanks to an executive order a couple years ago, uh, which really changed the tenor and the meaning of this phrase. I'm a little grumpy because SBOMs used to mean, uh, or used to be used for license compliance. And now they're all about security. And the uh, NTIA definition of an SBOM minimum elements doesn't even mention license anymore because security is important. We need to know what's in the thing. See what I mean? It's all still tangled and confusing. But when you have an SBOM, maybe you've downloaded a package from GitHub or from a foundation uh, or gotten something from your supplier, and they've actually given you an SBOM. If they haven't, you should ask for one. You might wonder, how was that SBOM generated? And can you trust that SBOM? Are you sure it's accurate? Is it complete? I mean, if it's signed, clearly, that means it's trustworthy. No. If you verify the signature, all that tells you is it wasn't tampered with in transit. It still doesn't tell you that it's complete, or it's accurate, or the person who wrote it isn't lying to you. You don't know any of those things. You don't know that it's going to match what someone else says. Uh, and you might have to do things like munge formatting. Maybe a CVE is published that says this version of this piece of software is vulnerable, and they use dashes in the software package name. And your SBOM contains underscores. And it doesn't match when you compare them. Oops. So signatures don't solve all these problems. But before we go further into this talk, Let's take a big step back and ask ourselves, what is trust? We're all asking, is this software trustworthy? Should I trust it? But trust is not a property inherent in any system or piece of software. It is an assessment of something based on experience. Trust is a declaration made by an observer, nay, an attestation. Um, it is not a property of the thing observed. And trust is always these three properties. It is time dependent. I might trust that software today and tomorrow learn about a vulnerability in it. It is asymmetrical. I might trust you driving a car with me as a passenger. You don't need to trust me for me to get in the car while you're driving, as a, right, because I'm not driving it. And trust is contextual. You probably shouldn't trust me to drive that car after three drinks. So, what can we trust? Well, if you're scanning the inputs of a build process, 
Maybe you've decided to download all the source for all your dependencies and rebuild it all yourself, because that makes it trustworthy. That doesn't necessarily explain the output, though. Right? If you're looking at someone else's build system and they say, here's what I put in, Maybe they used some compiler flags that they didn't tell you about, and that changes the output in some interesting ways. I mean, who here hasn't seen debug symbols accidentally left in a production build? Yeah. Well, if you only down the binary and you do some uh, deep scanning on it, you can often learn some things about its inputs. But it's not really that accurate, right? If I give you a pie and you have, say, some allergies, uh, and you ask, what's in this pie? Does it contain gluten? And I tell you, no, it doesn't. Are you really going to trust me with your life if you have a serious allergy? You could look at the pie. You could maybe do some poking and prodding. Wow, that, that dough doesn't feel like a regular dough. But mm, post hoc scanning isn't great either. Well, build tools inherently transform their inputs, whether it's a compiler or a linker or Docker build. Right? Part of what we use build tools for is that transformation. And I, I would posit that the only thing we really can trust is the build tool itself, because only the build tool really knows what transformation it performed and how it performed it. So what is a build tool? So how many people in the room have actually built something? Excellent. Good. So this is not going to be new to you. <laughs> so a, a build tool fundamentally is anything that takes a set of inputs, transforms them, and produces an output. And the world is littered with examples. So we're probably all familiar with compilers. A C compiler will take a C file and a bunch of .h files, and it'll output an object file. Java will take in, the Java C will take in a Java file and output a class file sometimes more than one class file, but let's not get into anonymous inner classes. Um, and what may be not clear to people is how many of you knew that Python compiles? Okay, much smarter than average audience. Um, <laughs> the Python interpreter actually compiles things to Python bytecode, and it writes them out as .pyc classes so that it doesn't have to recompile when it runs again. And then, as we move further up the stack in some languages, you get linkers. Uh, so the classic example of this is the C linker, which would take a bunch of object files that are results of compiling individual C files and their headers, link them together into an executable. Now you've got something you can actually run. And then you get to run times. So how many people actually know, I'm sure you all know, about shared objects? Shared objects? So even if I give you an executable, and I actually succeed in telling you precisely what's in that executable, you still have no idea whether you're safe when running it. Because in the runtime, the dynamic loader takes that executable, and unless it's statically linked, it'll take a set of shared objects and dynamically link them into the running executable. But even more so, there are entire languages that are predominantly dynamically loaded. When you are running anything in Java, every single class is being dynamically loaded by the class loader. It actually doesn't matter what the class file was that was present when I built my class file, as long as the class file that I loaded is interface compatible. And so <clears throat> runtimes become very crucial. And of course, the Python runtime pulls in .pycs. Um, any folks play with JavaScript in anger? <laughs> Things like Node.js are intrinsically dynamically loading JavaScript all the time. And then you get into interesting parts of the world with build tools, because there's a lot of places in the ecosystem where we use code generators. Any Go people in the room? How many of you have run Go generate? <laughs> right? So oftentimes, and this is true across many languages. Java has many code generators. Lots of languages have code generators. There are even things you know, that generate C code or CPP code that, that get used commonly in practice. And so a code generator takes some input. Maybe it's another piece of source code that it's transforming. Maybe it's something in a domain-specific language. Consumes that input 
and outputs a new source code file that goes on to be consumed by another build tool in the process. And this is a really fascinating one that most people don't think of as a build tool. So if you look inside most packaging systems, Debian files, RPM files, what you will discover is they contain an ostensibly pristine copy of the source code and then a collection of patches that get applied at build time. And many people, as a pattern for embedded work, will likewise do this, partially because we have tooling like Yocto that encourages it. They will get pristine source code and they will apply patches to it, which means that you take source code, a source code file, and a patch file as inputs, and you output a source code file. So, when we look at all these inputs and outputs across all the myriad of languages that we'd like to be able to understand, and the world is truly polyglot. If you use Python, odds are you don't realize some of the modules you're using are building C in the background. If you use Java, you probably don't realize that your JVM is actually built out of C++, and that if you're unfortunate. And if you use Docker, you probably don't even know how many languages are in that image. God help us all. <laughs> um, and so if we're going to try and reason about the world in a common way, and we're not going to have the Tower of Babel where we've got a million different ways that we reason about it, you have to ask about what are the commonalities. And the commonality is that all of these things, all of these software artifacts are arrays of bytes. Good? Oh. <clears throat> and so the next question you might have is, how am I going to identify an, ar an artifact, right? Um, what, you know, what is the identifier for it? And that naturally leads to a question. How do I know when two artifacts are the same? If I have foo.c and bar.c, are we going to decide they're not the same because they have different file names? Mm, file names are pretty ephemeral. But a reliable way to compare artifacts is to say, are these two source code files byte for byte identical? Are these two executables byte for byte identical? And we'll come back at, towards the end as to why this particular choice of identity is relevant here rather than, uh, say, the origin, where the file come from, which is a different way of determining identity. Identity, providence, and location can be very tricky when you commingle them. Um, but you'd like there to be some unique artifact identifier you can use for equivalent artifacts. So if you look at artifacts, you know, this is a non-exhaustive list of the kinds of things that we are talking about when we talk about artifacts, source code files, object files, shared objects, classes, jars, PYC files, any executable you care to name, Debian RPM packages, Docker images, the, 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 the list goes on and on and on and on because we live in a very complicated world. And so when we look at this, we're trying to figure out how we want to identify artifacts. It makes sense to ask because it helps us evaluate our choices. What characteristics do we want this identifier to have? And we maintain that there are three. You would like it to be canonical, which means that any two people in the world who pick up the same set of bytes independently without communicating with each other, arrive at the same identifier. We'd like it to be unique because we don't want to have an identifier that points to multiple non-equivalent artifacts. And we'd like it to be immutable because if we change an artifact, we don't want to have the same ID referencing it. So if I were to use file names and I have foo.c and I edit foo.c, we would like those to not have the same identifier. So I definitely can't use file names as identifiers. which brings us around to non-solutions. So we talked about file names, um, and in addition to you know, foo.c or bar.c being different, it really shouldn't make any difference if I build something in my home directory versus someone else building it in theirs. Um, when you look at things like URLs or Perl, these are locators. They tell you where to find something. Where you find something is not its identity. Location and identity are different. It even says location in the name. Indeed. So what about the minimum elements for an SBOM? Like I said at the beginning, not sufficient to identify something uniquely. Do you know if those two kernel builds 
from Microsoft or Cisco are exactly the same bytes or not. You have no idea, given the minimum identifiers of an SBOM. And in fact, you don't actually really even know what they are. Um, because when you look at a kernel source, the kernel source code for a particular kernel version, there are about 50,000 source code files in there. And depending on what knobs you tweak, you typically use a single digit number of thousands of them. And so if I tell you there's a CVE in the kernel version 5.17.3, do you know if you have it? Do you know if it's in this one or that one? You really have no idea. Yeah, so this makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's already solved, it turns out. Yeah, so how to identify things that are a stream of bytes everywhere has been solved really, really well. How and I love not reinventing things. Yes. How many of you have committed something this month? Okay, congratulations. You're already on board. Um, so Git solves this really well. It computes an object ID for the contents of every file that it stores in the repository. Um, it takes the contents of the file, and it outputs a 20-byte hash. So, and, and what may be less known is that Git's more of a Merkle tree masquerading as a source code management system. It's an object store in a Merkle tree. We're not going to call it a blockchain. <laughs> please, please don't. It's a Merkle tree. <laughs> we, we, we don't need uh, VCS3. Um, <laughs> so every leaf node is labeled with a cryptographic hash of, of a data block. And every non-leaf node, every directory, et cetera, um, has those hashes down the line so that if I give you the head of it as a commit, you can tell whether I'm lying about anything inside it. Mm -hmm. And so we think that Git object IDs, which are easy to compute even outside of a Git repository, are a suitable identifier for all software artifacts. In particular, because they are already being used to index much of what we do. Much of the software world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next slide, yours or mine? I think mine. Okay. So generalizing, right? So if I've got a build tool like a compiler, it takes C and H files and produces that O file, we can generalize it to think about it in terms of an input artifact, a set of input artifacts that get built with the build tool into an output artifact, just tying us back to the generalization. And we can describe that relationship with an input manifest, where the input manifest is simply um, a list of a prefix you know, one for each line, blob, and then the git object ID of that input, of that artifact in lexical order. Which, unsurprisingly, is the same file format as git uses in its own Merkle tree on disk. Yes, and we would like this to be computed by the build tool because only the build tool really knows what the inputs are for a particular output that it wrote. So, <clears throat> we can identify the input manifest for any input manifest by just computing the get object ID of it. And we refer to that as the input manifest identifier. Or, and we're still working on the pronunciation of the acronym, an IMID, IMD. Yeah, we, we coined this acronym this morning, so it's still workshopping it. And we would like to embed this into the output artifacts. So the goal is to have the build tools who know what it is, compute the, the input manifest, compute the identifier of the input manifest, and embed it in the output artifact. And pretty much all output artifacts have a place to put it. When you compile to an object file or an executable or a shared object, they're ELF files. You can have a, an ELF section that you insert the identifier into. In class files, you have annotations that you can use. In Docker containers, you have annotations you can use. Pretty much all up and down the line, even in source code, you can embed a comment line that contains the identifier. So what if an input has an image ID already embedded in it? Right? Say I actually patched a file, so it has an image ID and a comment in the source code file that I'm compiling. Well, in that case, we slightly augment the input manifest by adding bomb underscore and the input manifest ID to the single line record that we have for that input. And again, maintaining lexical order so that everyone is always going to compute input manifests the same way. 
And in this way, you can link things across different ecosystems and different languages without knowing how someone else was uh, how something else was built. So these input manifests taken together allow you to construct and describe what we call an artifact dependency graph. The artifact dependency graph, or ADG, is just a way of looking at the inputs and the resulting outputs and the outputs that are used as inputs all the way up the tree. And in this example, you can see where input manifest one captures information about both the artifacts two and three, but also information about the input manifest IDs and down the line. This forms a Merkle tree, which means that you have tamper resistance in the system. So to degeneralize, and just to sort of bring you back to the concrete, when we're talking about artifact dependency graph, an example here might be a bunch of CNH files that are rolled up into or built into object files by a compiler. The compiler can then pick up the object files, see the embedded input manifest IDs, compute input manifests for the executable, embed the input manifest IDs into the executable for the, at the linking step, and so forth. Really simple examples just to wet your whistle. You know, this would be the example of taking a C executable and dynamically linking with a shared object at runtime for a running executable. Or in the case of Java, Java files become class files, class files are loaded in the running executable at runtime. So as a whole, Omnibor is a minimalistic scheme for build tools to do these things, to build a compact input manifest that is composable into artifact dependency graphs up and down the chain. And by compact here, I mean it's about one one thousandth the size of the SBOM for the same artifacts. So Linux kernel, full build, full build SBOM is close to a gig. Uh, the Omnibore graph is about uh, a meg. I, something in that neighborhood, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Way more compact, more portable, more easy to search to embed an identifier for that entire manifest directly into the generated artifact. This is orthogonal to signing. If you are also signing artifacts, remember signing uh, shows you that it was not tampered with in transit. This, assuming you trust the build tool, tells you what in fact is in it all the way up and down its dependency graph. And to do this in a language heterogeneous environment, it should work from C, up through Python, up through Debian build, up through Docker images, uh, with zero developer effort. And this is the key that uh, got me really to, to push, uh, to put my effort behind this project. My goal here is to enable this to happen transparently for open source projects with zero effort from volunteer maintainers across the ecosystem. So think of it this way. Um, there are a lot of people running around turning to open source maintainers who are already stressed and saying, we need an SBOM. And of course, even if the open source maintainer is not of the grumpy variety, the very first question is going to be, how exactly? And why? Like, you're not paying me. I'm doing this in my spare time. Uh, generating this SBOM for you does me no good. Why am I going to do it? And uh, with what money? I don't have a CI system. I don't have a budget. I built this at home. And the goal here is for the how. The answer for the how to be, well, did you build? Yeah, it's just automatically there. That's what I want. Automatic for the people. Yeah. So there's a lot of cool stuff under construction in our community. Uh, we have a whole bunch of proof of concepts. Uh, these QR codes are just URLs up to our Git repos. Uh, there's also a bunch of recordings up on YouTube from our, our, our weekly meetings where folks have been demoing things like the LLVM Clang LD integration which instruments an entire Linux kernel build and then can be cross-referenced against known CVEs. Same, same thing for GCC and bin utils. We have demos in Go and Rust. BombSH is a really cool one that actually uses, I think it's Ptrace? It can use Ptrace to instrument from the outside. And yep. One of the interesting things there is it can operate it in a non-embedded mode and capture for an existing Debian build for a package you already have. If that package build is reproducible, it can ca capture the artifact dependency graph and it matches the Debian package you already have. Um, other things that are sort of interesting is minutia. Some of the things we discovered along the way is in the kernel, you occasionally need to keep track of assembler. We already have support for assembler. Um, so we've got broad support either coming, you know, coming up for a wide variety of languages in the community, 
Um, a couple that I forgot to add here is we actually have some support coming up in Java and Python as well yeah. um, that good. will actually be able to do things like answer questions like, what is the artifact dependency graph of my running JVM? And this can be crucial for something like log for shell yeah. where the root of that CVE is in a single JDNI realm mumble mumble dot Java file. But just because you have that jar doesn't mean you loaded that class. And if I've got 2,000 places where I think I've got log for shell and I've got 50 where I know I'm loading the class, which ones should I remediate first? So my hope with this is to be able to correlate CVEs when they're announced to the files that caused them, like this you know, log for j version blah, 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 or openssl.h version or hash blah, blah, blah deep, deep in dependency graphs that are far deeper than we are required to disclose in SBOMs, whether it's for a product or an open source project, um, and to enable that scanning to be done very efficiently, very effortlessly by response teams with uh, much higher signal to noise. One of the big complaints I hear from data forensics incident response teams is, gosh, we are drowning in SBOMs. When there is a known issue, uh, I get, you know, so many uh, hits when I search my list of S-bombs, and most of them are false matches. How many took high school chemistry? So the question is, what's the molarity of your system? Yeah. How many moles of CVEs do you have? I, I believe at a, at a <laughs> macro level, we as an as a, uh, industry, as a community, all doing open source and security, need to start thinking of vulnerabilities by their molarity and treating systems in very large uh, bulk not looking for which one system is vulnerable today, but out of the millions of systems in my infrastructure, which subset are affected by this specific thing, I need to pull those up to visibility with accuracy. So high signal to noise ratio is what I'm going for with this project. Um, so how do I get from, I've got instrumented build tooling, it's generating Omnibore graphs, how do I get from that to having an SBOM? Because I also do still need SBOMs for federal compliance. Well, hmm, that was a weird cut. Metadata. How are you going to flow that one? Well, I mean, uh, effectively, it, it comes down to understanding what is an SBOM really? And, and this was an observation by a colleague of mine that an SBOM is a format for organizing metadata that describes the makeup of the software artifacts doesn't really point to the software artifacts per se. It tells you their name, tells you their license. Maybe it, who you got it from. Yeah, who to reach out to if you have trouble. And all this metadata is really important, but it's a description. It's sort of like telling you how to get to my house by saying, okay, so go down the road until you see the big tree, turn left, there'll be a McDonald's at some point on your right, go three streets past that, turn right. Um, and all that's actually super useful if you're really trying to get to my house, but it's not my address. Or if you're a legal team who needs to know where a certain artifact came from during a lawsuit, which is what SBOMs were originally about, was licenses, not so much security. So with this, what we're doing is separating the metadata from the actual graph of the artifact itself. So... So effectively, the, the SBOM itself ends up being metadata. So if I have an artifact, I can extract the input manifest ID. I can go look up its artifact dependency graph and know exactly what's in it. From that artifact dependency graph, I can go to a store of metadata. Some of that metadata may be relevant to SBOMs. Things like what component name and version did the leaf source code come from? Some of it may be security related. Some of it may be performance related. Some of it may be compliance related. Whatever kinds of information you want to know about what's in your source code can be stored as a mapping between these artifact IDs and input manifests that describe the graph and the metadata that you need. And from there, you can then take that metadata and, for example, generate an SBOM. What about CVEs? Since my use case is getting better response when those happen. Well, if all of that is your metadata and you also have a graph and you know that this CVE comes from this specific artifact, well, you can scan really efficiently, find that, and surface up that data and then go from the CVE 
to the S-bomb. Given an artifact with its input manifest ID, you can look up in this ADG store, you can get the graph uh, and look up in the metadata store and go, ah, that's also affected by a CVE. I think this was, yeah, did you switch it? Possibly. Okay. So uh, effectively, it gives you the ability to know at fine granularity what you have. If you didn't build that file in, so let's say there's a bug in core utils, right? How many people know that core utils contains like 15 things, right? So if I tell you there's CV in core utils and you're not, you're only shipping one of the things in core utils, you've got another false positive to add to the molarity list of the CVEs that you're going through um, that we're all drowning in. Or I could know exactly that that vulnerability exists. I could also go up graph and note that even though this source code file is the source of the CVE, up graph there's a patch that is known to contain the fix. And therefore we know that we have this fixed, that we're not actually vulnerable in spite of looking like we might be. So we all really want to know, am I safe from a CVE or am I safe from a known vulnerable package? There's the slide I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Given that CVE, the next step will be annotating CVEs with the files that we know cause them. We can often do that by bisecting where they came into a project. And we, we actually already have tooling in the project that will go do this for you yep. and spit out that mapping. And then given that CVE and that mapping, you can then look up in a metadata store and scan all the known artifact dependency graphs from in your system, that you've ingested into your systems and go, which of my artifacts that I'm using right now are correlated? Find a list of vulnerable artifacts that you are running and then go look closer. Is there some reason why they might not be affected? Maybe they're not uh, exposed to the network in a way that that CVE becomes relevant. Who knows? But you have a really high correlation here that your response teams can then respond to efficiently. So. We'd love more folks uh, getting involved and helping out in all kinds of ways, including more POCs uh, for more languages. We'd love more help in different build ecosystems than we've been touching so far. I think we have a few minutes for questions. No, you. Yep, yep. yep you. Um, so I, I have a few questions. So yeah, let's say I have the uh, artifact ID. Is there some open database where I can query it and see what it corresponds to? Or assumption is that every company will have internal database and like uh, how, how, how I can convert the artifact ID yep. to, to... There is not... Ooh, this mic is much louder than that mic. There is not yet uh, a public instance or open database of this, but uh, I'm sure some interested company or companies or foundations might run one in the future. Okay, and so really quickly, we have done some work on this. We have some work that hasn't yet quite made it out to the Git repo that someone in the community did, where they took, they indexed the entire Ubuntu repository in order to grab the mappings between Git object IDs for source code files and um, component name version kinds of stuff. And it turns out that that's remarkably small, like order of 400 meg of JSON, like something you could load into memory. Um, and so I expect that we will see the emergence of these public databases, but I also expect that you'll see internal databases develop as well, because you also end up with the same indexing behavior for the proprietary source code that you built into things, even though no one outside your company knows what that identifier means. And even if you are a, uh, a provider of commercial closed source software, you could publish the artifact dependency graphs publicly without disclosing any of your secret sauce. Um, if at some point in the future a vulnerability were found in a component you're using, say again, I'll use OpenSSL as an example, um, well, it's really not that big a deal for your customers to, to then map that hash from the CVE to the dependency graph that you gave them under NDA with your product and go, oh, hang on, I should call my supplier up because it looks like I need a patch. Okay, uh, I have a few more questions. If Other, other questions? Question no. No. I, thought I, saw, I thought I saw a hand, but I didn't. Okay. Um, So how does uh, adoption and tooling look like today? You mentioned a lot of use cases. 
lie detecting CV, stuff like that. Do, do you already have the tooling for those? And uh, how widespreadly is it used today? Like, if we start using it in our company today, can we just start replacing the existing tools, or it's still going to take some time? So much of the code that we have right now is proof of concept code. Um, there have been talks given to the LLVM community about this, and that were received quite well. Um, the goal is, of course, to open to upstream this, so it simply pops into your favorite compiler. So the question becomes not what of, not one of, what do we do to adopt it? It's a, oh, it's here. Um, and the goal really is to get upstream for most of these. Now, this is not always going to be the answer for all the problems. We mentioned some cases with reproducing Debian builds that already exist, because there's a lot of brownfield in the world. Um, but that is the direction that we're going as a community. A lot of what we're doing is prep work to move upstream. And so really the, the help, the, the call for action here is if you're involved in any of these language or compiler or build tool communities, uh, we'd love your help adding support for this artifact generation to those build tools so that more companies can just get the benefit and more developers can just get the benefit from it without any effort on their part. Thank you. Uh, what what kind of hash hash sum are you using? Like sh hmm. sh sh uh, it, we're, we support the same format as Git, so SHA-1, SHA-256, optional flip in there, and you can have both in the same artifacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, for those who aren't familiar, Git object IDs are just a header that gives you the type of thing it is, a blob, and the size of it, and a null character, and then the contents, and then Git will compute either a SHA-1 or there's support now for SHA-256, it's very, very narrowly deployed. We actually support both in parallel so that we're future proof and so that anyone who would like to whine at us about shatter.io um, can basically be told that yes, we also have SHA-256 things in play. Yeah, because my concern was that the uh, SHA-1 for Git, it works because th that SHA is local to the repository, but in your case, that will be the global identifier across it, many, it, it, many It's not that it, it, it works not because it's local to the repository when you're talking about blobs. No, because uh, like th there are already known uh, collisions mm -hmm. between different repositories with the same hash. Mm -hmm. So if if you're going to use that SHA, it already may map to s a different, uh, there, there's a co co so co collision across let, let, Let's talk afterwards. I would love to hear more about the collisions. The last article I saw that GitHub published indicated they had seen no collisions in the wild. Ah, I was reading a blog post that there was a collision. I, I can look it up. I would very much like to know if that's true, um, but as of about a year ago, when GitHub was publishing on this, they were basically saying in their total store, they have never seen a collision in the wild. Okay. The, the blog post that I saw that might be the one you're referencing, might not, um, did point out that it is possible to artificially craft collisions, but in the wilds, in most file formats, they don't happen. Got it. Uh, yeah. I think we are... Are we at time? Or do we have time for one more question? I have one more if. <laughs> okay, no one else has come in the door, so I'll say one more question. Anyone? Yeah, I will go. Um, so the the diagram you showed for the in input manifest, there is uh, object file, header file, they go into the build tool, and the dot .o is, sorry, in the input you have C file, header file, and the uh, dot .o file on the output but the output also influenced by the build tool itself and the environment of that build tool. So I guess for the build tool, you can <laughs> capture the AMI ID of the build tool itself, but how do you capture the environment? So you're fun. Yeah. <laughs> this is an ongoing question. Uh, this is a, a, a very astute question and an ongoing discussion in our uh, spec design community to figure out the best way to do that. Okay, so it's still, yeah. So one, one thing that's been discussed is the, the build tool itself is, is literally the authority on what the inputs were. Um, there has been some discussion of having a document that allows the build to identify itself. This is my name. Um, and optionally, its own input manifest ID, if it has one, um, as a node that it puts in the tree. So C files, H files, and the tool descriptor file and then also to capture um, what it considers to be its non-ephemeral configuration information for that build step. And by non-ephemeral, I mean there are certain things that really don't matter. So the dash capital I flag in a C compiler, for example, 
um, is relatively immaterial. With the, the header files are in my home directory versus your home directory, we don't want that perturbing the build. But questions like what macros are set are very, very important. And that may also be something a build tool could choose to capture in such a node. But for the purpose of reproducibility of builds, if the build tool's own input manifest is encoded in the output, um, and you and I use different build tools that would otherwise produce the same outputs, we've now broken reproducibility. I can no longer verify your build. So this is a complicated edge, and like I said, we're, we're still discussing how best to do this, because uh, there are, seem to be trade-offs in both directions. Thank you. Yeah, an edge with no small amount of philosophy involved. <laughs>